just looking for somebody I can use that rope on, I mean with. <laughs> hey, well, welcome home. So good to be here with all of you. Good to worship together and good to see the house almost completely full. And the Spirit fill in the place, too. Man, great worship. Good sense of the Spirit here. And So I want to mention real quick, right after this, or as soon as you get your picnic or your lunch stuff and can come back, uh, the parking lot's going to be open. They've got bounce houses and a bunch of stuff. We've got, if you want to play volleyball, we've got bocce ball, we've got horseshoes, we've got a basketball court. Just a great time of hanging out and spending time together on a beautiful, beautiful day like today. I think it's what we ought to be doing. So I hope you have uh, uh, brought, if you haven't got your picnic lunch, we'll give you time enough to get back and here and bring it with you. And uh, we have no formal in opening that says, now we eat. Um, I'm going to thank God at the end of the service for all of our food. Some of you might not even make it to the parking lot the way you're looking here. So, But anyway, so that'll be happening right after this. And um, it's really a good time to be here. I want to talk about what is your life? Now, the scripture we're going to use, if you'd turn with me, is the book of James, James chapter 4. I'm going to read 14 verses and focus on a couple of words in one of those verses. We'll go back through and uh, kind of extend our our information a little bit more on what we've read. James chapter 4, I want to begin reading at verse number 1, if you would please follow in your Bible. James 4, beginning at verse 1, please follow along. It says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire to battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. You may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city or spend a year here or carry our business and make money, why You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So the book of James is considered to be the very first of the books that were written in the New Testament, somewhere around 50, maybe 60 AD. So it's the first of all of the books that were written. And interestingly enough, James is considered the Proverbs of the New Testament. I've heard, you've heard me many times talk about that book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, a book of wisdom, and how conveniently the book of Proverbs is divided into 31 chapters. It fits well with reading one chapter every day and reading it over and over again. There's never been a book written with more information about life and about how to deal with life and how to walk through life, how to respond to the No book ever written like the book of Proverbs. And if you read the chapter that corresponds with the day, you get pacted and impacted 12 times in one year with the best wisdom there's ever been written. So we know that of the Old Testament. The New Testament, the book of James is considered the book of Proverbs to the New Testament. And uh, 
It's interesting that in the concept of being a book that would be like the book of Proverbs or being a book that uh, would talk about life, it was written by this man named James. James is considered, this particular James, there's a few names in the Bible of different characters. This particular one was considered to be the lead pastor of the the home church, the capital church of Christianity in Jerusalem. It's shown that to be in Acts chapter 15 when the first controversy rose up in the early church. There was varying opinions as to what they would do, and after everybody said kind of what they thought, James was the one who stood up and said, Brothers, this is what we're going to do. He was kind of like the man in charge of everything. And he's talking about the concepts of life and and how you live your life. And in that verse number 14, he actually asks the question so that it becomes a ponderable. What is your life? What's your life about? All the dynamics, all the seasons, all that we walk through. And to him, I must say, life ended up not being very fair. Because this man James we're talking about, as best as history can understand, that um, he began to preach, and he was preaching in his hometown of Jerusalem. Problem is, he, began, he went to the Jewish church and was preaching Jesus on Passover, their most holy day. And what history says is that he was arrested. Some believe that he was actually taken to the pinnacle of the temple and thrown off of the pinnacle of the temple all the way to the ground and didn't die. But instead, it's some history to this that he actually got himself in a position to get on his knees. And some say the same prayer recorded that Jesus prayed, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they've done. Interesting because the devil in the temptation took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. And Jesus prayed that prayer, Father, forgive them. They don't know what you're doing. Here's the interesting part. This man, James, was the brother of Jesus. His own flesh and blood, born of the same family. He would have seen and known the Messiah. They would have grown up together. But life didn't deal him fair. He's saying, what is life? The ponderable, what's your life? What are you doing? What do you go through? He would have been aware even in the Old Testament because this is what the Old Testament mentions It mentions in uh, Psalm 90, verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80. There's a guy who's thinking, man, maybe 70, 80 years I got to work things out, and in biblical times, it would not have been too uncommon for people to live longer. But when he was thrown off the temple and didn't die, eventually he was taken captive and he was beaten with rocks until he was dead. And this happened about 60 AD. Now, if you just take the time slot... We all know that the beginning of our calendar traces back to within a few years of the birth of Jesus. Jesus, when he was born to Mary, Mary was a virgin. So James would have been a younger brother of Jesus. So however long, what that time frame is, let's say that his birth date would have been in the year five. And he's martyred and killed in 62. He got cut short. He didn't even get to live the life that the Bible says, hey, perhaps we get 70, maybe 80 years. He never got to experience that. He would have been younger than 60, maybe in his mid to late 50s, and he was martyred for his faith. But still, he poses that question, what's life? What is your life? I'll ask you that. How is your life lived out? What is it that you have done? What is it that you're doing? How would you describe where you are what you're doing, and how things are for you. So I want to use this rope as a type of example, though twisted as it was. See how good I got that out of there? Here's our life. I'm going to to give you the example. We're going to talk about some of those dynamics. And here's the reason that this is a different color. Because we know the end is coming. Going to be here. This represents the last part. We know it's at the end of the life, what we don't know is how long our rope is. We just know that there is an end, that it is coming. But in between this and this, we would have to answer the question, you will all have to answer for you, as I will have to answer for me. Watch out. (laughs) What's your life? Think of the stages of your life. 
We're going to find a place in what I'm going to talk about where every one of you live. Actually, when I read that scripture, you know, if you get 70, maybe 80, I thought, man, I'm too close. <laughs> I don't like that. Some of you are, are much closer, and some of you are going, uh-oh, if 80's the max, where do we go? How does that play out? If you think of the dynamics of life, everything you would go through. I sat down and started listing birth, infancy, childhood, adolescence, youth, early adulthood, adulthood, midlife, mature adulthood, late adulthood. I never said old, folks. I never said old. <laughs> never said aged. And then the end. I actually find it interesting when I was studying that, the stages of life. I actually found that psychologists have grouped all of the seasons of life into four different stages. Let's talk about those and maybe bring up some memories for you in your answering the question, what is your life? They put it in four stages. The first stage is birth, infancy, childhood, and adolescence. They call it stage one. And what clarifies what stage one is, is play, imitation, and education. Stage two is the adolescence, early adulthood, and adulthood. This is what psychologists call self-discovery, enterprise, and adventurousness. Stage three is adulthood, midlife, and mature adulthood. This is where they say that you create dedication, contemplation, and benevolence. Stage four is late adulthood through death. And they say during this time, you look at retirement, Wisdom and renunciation. Knowing some stuff that you did that maybe you shouldn't have, you're recognizing. So let's talk about what is your life. This was to represent your life. You know the end's coming. Some of us are a little closer than others, but here's the reality. Nobody knows how long that is. Nobody has any idea of that. But let's talk about first the one season or stage of your journey, you can't remember anything. Birth. I know I've heard all of these crazy things, and if you're a psychologist, you can forgive me now because I'm about ready to offend you. If you believe in this stuff where you can go back to primal scream, go back to seasons that you don't remember and under hypnosis, or Lord knows what else. You remember coming out of the birth canal? Look at I don't want any help to remember any of that. <laughs> I don't want to know that. Here's what I know. I started. That's all I want to know. But we don't remember much of that. Some of you, if you were to think a little bit more about some of the seasons of your early life, I would imagine most of the things you would remember from your very early childhood are not so much your recall as much as it is your parents telling you, you can't, I can't believe how bad you were. My dad always used to say to my brother and I, oh, I hope that both of you have a dozen just like you. <laughs> but thank God that didn't happen. He gave us each two that were worse than a dozen apiece, so we got even in the end. <laughs> but the stories I know about infancy are the stuff my parents told me. You know, how, how, how absolutely amazing I was. <laughs> how it was so easy to to break me from the bottle, how I potty trained like in 30 minutes. I mean, so many great things <laughs> that my parents say about me that some of you are believing about yourself. But those are the early parts of our life, but it's still a part. It's a part of our life. Early childhood. Some of you remember some of your, uh, some things that you did, some things, uh, things you played with. Maybe I, I have in our drawer at our house, my mom gave to my wife, and in one of the drawers of the house are my original teddy bear. And then this little stuffed guy, I, it's Mickey, or no, it's not Mickey Mouse, but it's something printed on it. I mean, it's all tattered and everything. And I hold it, I close my eyes, I can't remember a thing. I just know my parents said... <laughs> It's part of the life. It's just part of that chain, part of yours. You have those too. Then you remember going to school. Now, I'm not going to, don't call them out. How many of you can remember the name of your kindergarten teacher? So look at that. You guys are good. Wow, wonderful. And uh, how many of you remember your best friend in elementary school? Maybe one in particular. We even have having more. You know why? Because it's all a part of that life. It's part of what you're going through. 
your childhood, your neighborhood, maybe a favorite game you played all the time when you were a kid. Ours was kick the can. It's a lost art. You know why? Because they don't have an app for it. Kick the can. It meant you found a little, some kind of a place and you put any kind of tin can and somebody was it. And everybody else went and hid. And I don't know how you played it, but the guy who was it had to find, if you could see them, if I could, if I could look back and see Christina, she's, she's hiding somewhere in the bushes, I'd say, I'd run to the can and I'd jump over and say, one, two, three on Christina, and she was out. But if somebody snuck past me and kicked the can, everybody was free and I had to do it again. Our favorite game, I, we played that for hours. We'd put black clothes on, charcoal on our face. We were serious. <laughs> It's part of all the games we played when we were kids. Some of you remember those. You remember maybe some challenging times of your life, but they were still. All of us varying degrees of remembrance, but all of us did have and do have those memories. Some of you might remember when you're a little bit later on, maybe past in your elementary school, going to junior high. Can you recall the name of the junior high you went to or the couple of them that you did? Remember when you went from one class a day to where you had several classes a day, the transition of education and some of the classes, maybe one particular class you really did enjoy. What is it? It's your life. It's the story of your life. And many of you, in just this brief moment, you're being lost in the remembrance of all of those things because James says, and it must be some sobriety that he's calling us to, what is your life? What do you remember about that stage one? The, then you get into adolescence, starting into that stage where in an unbelievable, fantastic, almost supernatural sense of how much you know. <laughs> and it happens really quick. You ever notice that? Some of you don't think about that for yourself. I'm telling you, it's probably part of your story. You know, I heard one uh, lecturer say it never occurs to, to, a, to a young person that one day they will be as dumb as their parents. <laughs> it's that adolescence. You're, you're knowing more. You're, you, you don't need... Uh, no, no, don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass any of you. But was, was, is there anybody present here that thought, what, what, what a waste school is. I don't need all this stuff. I'm never going to use this again. I can get out on my own. I can make it. I'll change the world. It's part of your life. Your adolescence. Well, let's say you finished that lesson, which you did. Now you're in stage true, two, which is adolescence, early adulthood, and into adulthood. Then comes high school, the best eight years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> and all the things you did in high school. Maybe you played sports in high school. Great memories. Maybe some of you still have friends with some of the friends that you made in high school. and Maybe it was band, maybe it was in dance, maybe home ec, maybe it was a, uh, some sort of a shop class. You know, some of you really excelled as I did. The best, the best subject I took all the way through school was summer vacation. If they gave grades, I would have graduated early, but I was really good at it. It's just, what is your life? What was your high school years like? For some of you, it's not that far back. For some of you, you're still living that adolescence. You're still there. And then adulthood. You know, adulthood had some advantages and had some great disadvantages. Because when you're young, I mean, you want to grow up, but you really don't want to. Adolescence into adulthood, I discovered, was the desire for adult privileges and child responsibilities. But it's life. You go through that and you become adult. Whether or not you want to, you become an adult. And now the consequences of your actions are no longer, or they're just a kid. Now it's big consequences. Now you get in trouble and it can be real trouble. And some of you, maybe through adolescence and maybe into young adulthood, maybe your story is a little more sordid and a little more afraid. But it's your adolescence and your young adulthood. And this is when we start to, if we're not cautious, we make mistakes. And those mistakes have consequences, some of which are very difficult to get away from as you continue to get older. And maybe it's during this season of your young life and in your early adulthood, maybe this is when you, you have this next strand. It's, it's when you get married. Find the love of your life. 
And initially, when you do that, you just find, you, you fall deeply in like with somebody. And then by your choice, you invest your emotions in that individual. I don't believe people fall in love. Not one bit. I think in our lives, somewhere, somewhere back here, we, we make a list of things we like about people. Could be your mom had blonde hair, you want to marry a mom. Could be your dad was hard working, you want to meet a guy. But you make a list of the things you like. And then when you get to this part, in essence, you're searching for somebody who checks most of, the list, most of the things on your list. And when you find people that check most of those things, you make a choice to invest your emotions in them. And that's what love develops into. Problem is, we have a checklist of the stuff we never want anybody to do to us. But if you only look at the checklist of the good stuff and check that off, you forget to look at the list of the things that you said you would never let anybody do, and that can cause great issue for you in relationship. But adulthood, that's when you get married. Maybe you start having your own, and the curses your parents put on you about having a dozen start happening. But it's, it's adulthood. It's a new season. It's something new in your life. There's responsibility. You realize that now you're just not the depending on yourself. But all of a sudden you wake up and there's other lives who are dependent on you. You never asked for it. Not in that sense. But pretty soon there are people who are dependent upon you. Your children. Maybe there's a boss and it's no longer just a menial job. You, you actually have a, a life that you have to support yourself with. And there's other co-workers who depend on the performance of your life. You know what? It's just all of your life. What is your life? It's learning responsibility. Learning to do the things that you need to do. Learning to do them better. It is, as they said, the season of discovery, enterprise, adventurous. Stage three, midlife and adult. It's the time of dedication. You may have been a little hard for you to commit yourself to a lot, but the older you get, the real, more you realize the importance of being committed. Committed to something. You start setting things in your life that you're not going to compromise. When you're young, just the next thing becomes whatever it is that you're going to make yourself adapted to. The older you get, you realize that you can't continue to adapt to yourself to different things. You set a set of standards and those become your unalterables. They become the things that you stand for. They become the things you won't compromise. Because you know that part is coming. You got enough time, continue on. You're not planning for the end, but you know it's on its way. So you're making commitments on things. Unalterables in life. You realize... Unlike all of this, you get to a certain age in your life where you're married, you got some kids that like you, you have nobody left to impress. It's the seriousness of life. Dedication to things, and as you're walking through that, that becomes the next seasons of your life. And then you get to that fourth stage, late adulthood. And you begin to take a lot of things serious. It doesn't mean that you can't have fun. Just your perspective on a lot of things change. You understand how important certain things are. You begin to understand the things that you cannot in good conscience ever compromise. You really do have those things you won't negotiate. At the same time, kind of as an oxymoron, you realize there's a lot of stuff you were really serious about that just turns funny. Especially when you see other people doing it. Life actually, in, in the stage of my life, I, I'm 66, I find a lot of things funny now. Just odd, oddly funny. Funny and odd. People, funny and odd, it's the same thing. You get to this point where you start looking at things. Ron and I will go places now, and all we do is go and watch people. <laughs> Maybe because we lack the energy to go do it, we just want to watch it. It's better than anything on television if you've not tried it. Go and just watch people shop. We have, a, uh, we have a boat launch out. We live in Brentwood. There's a boat launch not too far from us. And probably every other week, we go and get dinner right at the counter space so we can sit and watch people launch their boats. It is hilarious. 
It's just contemplating more. You're seeing more. You know why? Because it's your life. Those of you who are there understand it. Those who don't, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it's that last stage. It's hopefully more maturity. It's, it's a little more seriousness. Here's when you begin to understand that when you know that end's coming, begin to understand that it's important to make deposit in others so that when you leave here, it's not just a memory that remains alive, but it's an investment in other lives. This is when you can, because you lived some of the wisdom, you can talk wisdom. It's the time when you have grandkids and you know you're, you just can't discipline them like you did your own. So what you do, you ruin their lives. But what else you do as a grandparent is you want to have those moments that you impart because some of you might remember early on where you had a grandfather and say, let me tell you about this. Become someone that you impart other things. And as your life continues on, wherever you are in any of those stages, you need to understand we always keep thinking about that end. It's coming. We just don't know when it is. And the Bible, even though it says you get 70 or 80 years, you all know that that isn't a written guarantee. Because that comes at varying times to varying people. But we know eventually our life does have a conclusion. Now, I want to share with you something that I think is the most important thing you're going to hear me say. When I ask you, what is your life? And maybe in, maybe in the description of some of those stages and even the characterization of some of the stuff in, in my life, maybe some of you can relate to those things. And you get caught in those moments and caught in the thoughts and good times and maybe some challenging times. But you do understand that James says to think, what is your life? But I want you to look back at verse number 14 with me for just a second. Because not only does James ask the question, he gives an answer. Look at what he says in verse number 13 and 14. Now listen, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on your business, and yes, why you do not even know what will happen. What is your life? That's the question. But we didn't finish the verse. Because look what he says afterwards. You are a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. Here's what I want you all to realize. As we've kind of climbed through the rope and gotten at the, the beginnings and the birth and all of those stages, I did that as an illustration, but now I want to give you the correctness of the illustration. Because we think, when we think what of our life, we think of all the rope and we know the end is coming. I want to tell you something else. That isn't true. Because this is your life. This is your life. It is a vapor. We think life is so long because we're in the middle of it. There's so much going on and so many more things to do and places I've got to get to and things I need to give responsibility. We have lost the perspective that the Bible says about what life is. Because your life's short. This is your life. This is eternity. And we think of all of this that we've got and all of the experiences left and we have no guarantee. That's why James says you ought to think about it, but think about it in perspective because this is your life. What is it? It's just a vapor. It's one small portion of the existence. And you know what we're doing? We're spending all of our time on this and almost no time thinking of eternity. We're thinking about all the stuff today. Some of you, while you were sitting here, and I was doing my best to captivate your attention, you've already been to five or six other places. You've been to tomorrow already. This week at work already. Phone calls you've got to make. It's not that we shouldn't think of those things, but please understand the biblical perspective from a man who wrote the book of wisdom for the New Testament era. What is your life? It's this. It's short. All those years are just crammed into a little bit because the length of your existence is not this part. It's what eternity is. Because over and over in the Bible... 
it begins to use and continues to use this frame, eternal life. We think that eternal life is now because there's so much packed into it. No, in comparison, everything you have done and every experience you have is just that part of your existence. What we have to do all the time, we've got to have that perspective of what eternity is. Because none of us have a guarantee. None of us have anything that says, oh yeah, you get that 70, or yeah, you get that 80. You get so many years, you don't have that guarantee. You do not have that that says, that's how long it is. Because in comparison, this is it. Because there's an eternity. The book of Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. I know there's all kinds of people that say, well, I don't believe in any of that. You know what? My personal opinion, it doesn't matter how many people or how many times a person would say to me, I don't think about anything beyond this life. I would disagree with them. I think everybody thinks about the end sometime. You think about what that means. Someone once said that to the atheist, death is the end. To the agnostic, it's the sound of silence. But to one who believes, it is a beginning. What is your life? It's a time where you live a whole lot of stuff, but it's, it's only small compared to what eternity is going to be. What do you do to prepare for eternity? How do you change your perspective? Well, there's a couple of things. The first is to realize that God has destined an eternity for, for you. Just like the destiny of you being born, when you were born, to whom you were born, and the circumstances and environment all of you lived in. All of that God had destined for you. He placed you where you were. It doesn't mean that everything bad that happened to you that God had determined it would be bad. But God knew that through those experiences, it would create something in you for the continuation of the next stage and the next. And wherever you are now in that, that's where you sit and God says, you've got to have the perspective. Yeah, all of that's happened, but you've got to have a different perspective. And this perspective is there's an eternity after this, folks. What is your life? It's a vapor compared to how long eternity will be. A time where there won't be a clock. A time when things won't be regulated. Well, I've got to get this done. No, you won't. Because you'll be there forever. Forever and ever and ever. It will not have an end. So the importance of things, yeah, now, yes. But the focus of things eternal, I hope so. You know, the book of Revelation, the last book of the, of the Bible in the New Testament. When John saw all of these amazing things, in, in Revelation 1, the Bible says an angel came and he, he showed all of these things symbolically, to, and he saw all these amazing things. Some of them, he didn't know what they were. He, he even asked questions to the angel that's communing, well, who is this? And they explained it. And other things, he'd, all he did was explain it. When it comes to the end of the book, and he saw all of these things, you know, John didn't say, wow, I hope you'll show me now and let me understand everything. That's not what he said. You know what John saw? With all of the cataclysmic things in the book of Revelation, stuff pouring out of the sky, people dying, wild beasts roaming around, all of these challenges, the bride coming along, everything. He saw it all. You know what John's response was to everything? He had life, yeah. And John met with some pretty dire situations. They tried to kill him. It wouldn't work. Other things, they didn't work. You know what he said after he saw the panoramic and the outlay, things that were to happen toward and coming to the end. You know his response to the whole thing? Second to last verse in the entire Bible. He just said this, come Jesus. Come. Not I want to understand things better. No, no, come. Why? Because he had the correct perspective on what his life was. Life is filled with all kinds of things. But what we have to do is something that settles in our heart that every single day we say, yeah, I've got to do this. I've got to be at work tomorrow at a certain time. Yeah, I'm going to have a picnic later on. We're going to put... No, have those things, but have the perspective of eternity. And in every season, in every challenge, and all that you walk through, you just keep thinking, yeah, Jesus is going to come back. Or my season's going to finish. And have, an, have a perspective on eternity. Eternity will not have an end. 
And the Bible makes it clear. Whether or not you embrace it is irrelevant. It's the truth of what the Bible says about the one who is eternal. Therefore, he measures what is eternal. And that's the Almighty God. Because you're going to have that part. You're going to have an eternity. Every one of us are going to have that eternity. What that eternity looks like is up to you. Because something has been provided for you to alter what that is. And the Bible makes it clear. The Bible talks about people who were punished because of things they did. People who made choices that weren't pleasing to God. And the Bible says there's a repercussion for how you do this. Determines what this is going to be. And for those who have chosen to live in rebellion to the Almighty God, have decided that what they're going to do is make their life what they want it to be without any regard for the Almighty Creator of the universe. And the Bible says there's an eternity connected to that, but it's an eternal punishment. Hell, not a popular topic to preach on. Hell, the Bible describes as a place of torment. It says there's going to be weeping, crying out, grinding of teeth because it'll be tormenting. Fire that will burn you, but you will never be consumed. And it's going to be forever. You know what will make hell the worst thing of all? Was hell was created as a place of punishment for the devil and the demonic, demonic spirits that are with him. They were the ones who were cast there. You know what's going to make it bad for anybody who chooses to go there? you won't be a welcomed guest. The devil and all the demonic powers, they are there, that's their punishment, and they don't like it. One thing they are going to enjoy is seeing whoever goes there because their torment becomes that person's torment. You see, we think about the life. We don't think about the eternity, but that's the reality. But there is an option to change what that eternity is because the Bible says, That if you believe in the story of who Jesus was. See, that's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ. He sent his son in his life for 30-something years. And when Jesus came and what he did, how he lived, he gave himself as a sacrifice because everyone should be punished by all the wrong we've done. That's just natural. You do something bad, you ought to, you know, you do do the crime, you pay the time. You should be punished. Here's the good news, you don't have to. You don't have to be punished for everything you've done that's wrong. Because that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus didn't do anything bad, but he was beaten. His beard pulled out, spit on, mocked, hung on a a, a cross, placed upon it until he died in anguish and died a horrible death. Why would somebody have to suffer that? Because I should have done that for all of the stupid stuff I've done. But Jesus died to take that penalty. He died to take your penalty. So the perspective is this. Your life is but a vapor. Seems so long, but it's short in comparison to what eternity is. And you determine what your eternity is going to be. You live outside of relationship with God, though he created it, he made you to be eternal. God gave that to you, became a living soul just like Adam did in the garden. God has provided for you an opportunity to live an eternity that's better than anything we can even comprehend with all of the creative ability of our mind. But yours is an eternity where Jesus is coming back. When that is, I don't know. Today would be a good day as far as I'm concerned. He's coming back to get all of those who have accepted what he did for them. All your wrongs are gone. All of your sin is forgiven. And it's just by you believing that and, ma- and saying that you believe that, that your eternity is looking good. Or you can reject that and know that your eternity is not going to be very good. And it's not going to serve you well. Our hope is not just in this life. Paul would write to the church at Corinth, if in this life only we have hope, we are miserable people. You see, friend, ask yourself, what is your life? Think of all the experiences. Yeah, that's your life. But the big picture is, what is your life now compared to life in eternity? Because you have that. And the choice that you make determines what that's going to be like. That way, through your life, through every season of life. Yesterday we had a beautiful memorial service for a great friend of mine, a man who served us 30 years as an elder in this church, Howard Bowles. 
And I was thinking about it when we were, when we were here honoring Howard, and I thought, you know, there's a perspective. 76 years, you know what? Howard's got more than 76 years in eternity. It's knowing that that becomes so much better than what this is. So I want to pray with you today. So I want every one of us in sobriety to think about what your life is. What is it that you're thinking of? What is it that you only focus on? It's not that you can be dismissive of what your life is. You just got to think about it in perspective. It's a mist. It's a smoke. Like lighting a candle and blowing it out and watching those fumes dissipate into the atmosphere. That's what your life is like in comparison to eternity. Next time you're ready to make a very poor choice, just wonder if that was your last choice. How are you prepared to enter into that eternity? And how are you ready to enter that eternity right now as we close in prayer? What is your life? It's like a vapor. Therefore, we've got to focus on the part that has the greatest value. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we are very blessed for an opportunity like this to come together, just to be in your presence. The sense of your power and worship was, was really great. And in these last moments when we've collectively looked at your word and, and maybe for ourselves, I hope we all asked ourselves, what is my life? Memories of things? Yeah. Good memories? Yes. Very hard memories? Absolutely. We all have them. But I pray that our perspective would be correct and that we would understand everything that we're doing here is just temporary compared to how long eternity is. Because it's also described as everlasting life. It's going to continue on. There's not going to be an interruption. No tape at the end. It'll continue on in eternity. And I pray for everyone who is here. I pray, God, that if there's just one person here, maybe they've heard something similar to this and never responded. Maybe they've never even considered what their life is until now. Lord, I pray for that person or those people. I pray that the picture of this rope will not be dismissed out of their minds, but that they'll understand there is an eternity. There's something beyond this. Saying it doesn't exist doesn't cancel it out. Because it is there. And I pray, God, for everyone who maybe has not made the correct adjustments to prepare for that, I pray they'd consider doing it now. And for everyone here, I have my eyes closed. I hope you do too. This is nobody's business but you and God. I'm going to ask you, if you've only concentrated on life and you've never thought about the prospect of eternity. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. You don't even have a guarantee of this afternoon. What you have is this moment. Your life is like a vapor compared to eternity. And here's all you need to do. The Bible says if you believe, if you believe inside that Jesus Christ when he came, he lived a life, he lived it without sinning. And he was horribly punished, tortured, and he died. And if you can believe that when he went through all of that and died, it was to pay for the punishment of everything you've ever done that's wrong. That's all you have to, you have to believe that that's true. And if you believe that, then you acknowledge that. And then in acknowledging that, the Bible says you then have eternal life, everlasting life. Perspective is adjusted. Understanding is corrected. And if that's you, right now, here's what I want you to do. Again, just you and God, and you can whisper this as quietly as you want to, but I want to lead you in a very simple prayer to acknowledge those things for God and to accept this beautiful gift he's given to you of eternity. And you don't have to say the exact same words, but maybe in thought, 
If you want to repeat the words, you can do those after me. And this is for anybody. Everybody is here. Everybody who's listening to us live right now or those who will watch it later on. I just want you to say this by your words. Just say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving me enough that I was included, that my wrongdoing and my sin was all paid for, Jesus, when you died on the cross. Forgive me for what I've done that's wrong. I accept your forgiveness now. And I believe that after you died, you came back and you're alive now. And you hear me right now as I pray. I receive this gift you give to me. And I pray you would work in my heart or I would be as anxious as the writer of Revelation and that I can now say, come Jesus. So Lord, I thank you for all who have prayed that prayer in faith. This is the beginning of a brand new season for them as they grow and develop in their lives. So we thank you, Jesus, for all of that and for this day. And for everyone else, I pray our perspective would remain keen. What is our life? Yeah, we've got a busy week, but really, what is our life compared to what eternity is? Help us to always stir and remember, Jesus, you're coming back. And may our hearts also say, come. Come quick. We look forward to that, Jesus. And I pray all this together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, before, you, before you stand, some of you who prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something. It's nothing that's going to embarrass you. In the, in the pockets in front of you, there's a little card that says Next Steps. And I'd like you to consider filling that out. Uh, the library, which is just to the left of the double doors as you exit. Uh, if you'd turn that in, or maybe you've already made that commitment, but either way, I want to give you a Bible today. It's the Bible I read from here, and in it there's a little bookmarker that talks about how to read the Bible. Maybe you've never really approached it or never thought about how to do that. Maybe you've already committed your life to being a follower of Jesus. You didn't need to fill out the card. Still, if you want a Bible, go get one, get one of the bookmarks. It'll kind of help you in that process. So uh, for those of you who prayed that prayer, that's the best thing you ever did in all of your life. So let's all stand together. Two things, men, looking at all of you, trying real hard. Men, go sign up today for the men's breakfast next Saturday morning. We in the fellowship hall, five bucks. This is for the all men of all ages, males of all ages, come for breakfast, Pastor Moses Akumo is going to be speaking there next Sunday. Pastor Moses Akumo is going to be speaking here. If you've never met him, an amazing man of God from Uganda, great friend of this body. And we're going to come back next week, one service, 9.45. Come back. For some of you, you, had to, you got to sleep in, and for some of you, you had to come early. But next week... Let's come back. Let's fill the house. And just in a moment, grab your lunch. I'll meet you outside. God bless all of you.